In an unsettling account, a Ukrainian soldier captured by Russian forces has described the chaotic and brutal conditions on the front lines, painting a bleak picture of the experiences of soldiers thrust into battle with little preparation or support. Many that I know were told they'd be in the rear, but they were sent to the front just like that, cannon fodder, to be shot. I think there's nothing wrong with surrendering, simply put, and then we'll get exchange, maybe something else will happen. But there's nothing scary about it, not like they keep telling us, none of that's true. His testimony provided during captivity reveals the confusion, fear, and eventual surrender that marked his journey from being a non-combatant to a prisoner of war. Meanwhile, Russian military officials are reporting substantial victories in the ongoing conflict in the Kursk region. Fighters of the Akhmat Special Forces, in coordination with the 2nd Brigade of the Special Forces, have destroyed significant Ukrainian military hardware over the past day, according to Major General Apti Alaudinov, the deputy head of the Russian Armed Forces Main Military Political Department and commander of the Akhmat Special Forces. In the footage, there are six of our fighters who, since August 6th, from the moment of the invasion of the Ukro-fascists into the Kursk region, were at one of the border sections. Four of them are servicemen of the Akhmat Chechnya Regiment of the Russian Ministry of Defense, and two are border guards. They held their positions, although they were practically completely surrounded. Despite the complexity of their situation, these fighters repelled numerous enemy attacks until they ran out of ammunition. After that, they left to avoid being captured and took 40 young conscripts out of the encirclement with them. For 18 days, they made their way through forests and enemy blockades to our units. Alodinov further detailed the damage inflicted on Ukrainian forces, noting, Over the past day, we have also wiped out one automatic grenade launcher squad, one mortar, and also destroyed a cannon gun. By delivering strikes on all of this military hardware, our guys inflicted numerous casualties upon Ukrainian troops. He emphasized that the enemy has been successfully halted and continues to face significant losses daily in the Kursk area. The enemy is indeed making attempts to advance, but to no avail. We have already launched work in numerous areas to destroy the enemy and liberate some settlements. I believe that this work will progress with each day. These developments come in the wake of a massive Ukrainian attack on the Kursk region that began on August 6th. Since then, missile alerts have repeatedly been declared across the region, heightening the tension and intensity of the conflict. Against this backdrop of escalating military action, the captured Ukrainian soldier's testimony highlights the personal toll of the war. He recounted how he was conscripted despite severe health issues, including a perforated ulcer and spinal problems. I have a perforated ulcer, numb legs, a messed up back, and a whole bunch of other problems. And I was, what's it called, non-military. Those who weren't taken into the army were being taken as well. The local officer came to my house, knocked on the door, and said, take your passport, let's go. I told him that I wasn't mobilized, that I couldn't be in the army. And he said, we'll go to the hospital, sort everything out there, put a check mark so that the military enlistment office won't bother you anymore. And they did. Reflecting on his deployment, he expressed betrayal by his own command. They sent us to Volchansk to a position. We arrived at the position in Volchansk at a kindergarten. We were just standing there. Our post was just to observe. Then we started getting attacked. Another guy and I immediately suggested surrendering but there were those who didn't want to surrender. Well, what kind of guys, they're all dead now. They got on the radio and said, they're offering us to surrender. What should we do? They said, never surrender, say until the end. What was the point? Those who didn't want to surrender are now lying dead in the basement. His account underscores the stark contrast between the official narratives of the war and the grim realities faced by those on the ground. I have a perforated ulcer, numb legs, a messed up back, 
and a whole bunch of other problems. And I was, what's it called, non-military. Those who weren't taken into the army were being taken as well. The local officer came to my house, knocked on the door, and said, take your passport, let's go. I told him that I wasn't mobilized, that I couldn't be in the army. And he said, we'll go to the hospital, sort everything out there, put a check mark so that the military enlistment office won't bother you anymore. And they did. The military enlistment office took me to Kilia, and there were the CCC, Central Committee people. By lunchtime, the medical commission was already done, and everywhere it said I was healthy and fit. I didn't even enter any office, hospital, or clinic. They came in, collected signatures. They do things badly. They kill their own people. Two of us surrendered, but one didn't make it. Our own shot him. We were told that we would be in the rear. People like us don't go to the front. Again, like you said, they lied. I ended up at the military enlistment office, and when I got there, I realized that everything was lies. They sent us to Volchansk to a position. We arrived at the position in Volchansk at a kindergarten. We were just standing there. Our post was just to observe. Then we started getting attacked. Another guy and I immediately suggested surrendering. But there were those who didn't want to surrender. Well, what kind of guys? They're all dead now. They got on the radio and said, they're offering us to surrender. What should we do? They said, never surrender. Stand till the end. What was the point? Those who didn't want to surrender are now lying dead in the basement. The two of us surrendered with an old man. We wanted to surrender right away, but they didn't. Then the guys asked, are you going to surrender? We said, yes, we will. They treated us well. And the old man, the other old man, had a leg wound, he was wounded. They immediately gave him pain relief, bandaged him up, and provided medical assistance. I had back problems. He asked, do you need pain relief now? I said, give it to me tomorrow when you're leading us out so I can run. We had to run because our own people were shooting at us from behind. When we were running, first with AKs and then with machine guns, what's there to evaluate when your own people want to kill you? I even understand why they wanted to kill us, probably so that we wouldn't surrender. Especially when we were sitting in the basement, we said we were already surrounded. They said, hold on, we'll think of something. And then a BMP, infantry fighting vehicle, shell flew into the basement, right at the basement door. They pinned the door and the old man got on the radio asking, what are you doing? They said, we were working on the first floor. It was just an accident. What kind of accident? It was clear. When we ran to the five-story building, they shot at us with AKs, but we made it, all three of us. One of the Russians, well, a guy, led us into their five-story building. We made it to the building, sat there for about three hours, and then started running further towards captivity. So, we were running, and there were gates and a road, and only our positions there, no Russian positions. And from there, they started shooting at us with a machine gun, and there were ricochets, fragments, and a little in the stomach. Oh, and the old man got hit in the leg. He fell. They said, get up, the guys said. He tried to get up, but right before our eyes, well, he's dead now. There were no Russians there, only our positions. And captivity is not like they say here. Here, they say it's horrible in captivity, that they cut, torture, and beat you. But the doctor helped with my back, and they treat the wounded and feed you three times a day. Waiting for exchange is really scary. It's scary that they definitely won't go easy on us. If they wanted to kill us when we were running, I feel they won't talk much there either. I know for sure one thing, I won't take a rifle in my hands again. I said, prison, prison. There will still be prison. Even back in training, they told us that you get a term just for holding a rifle. I don't have a rifle, no body armor, no helmet, no backpack, nothing. We've already handed in everything. People like us are considered cannon fodder. After the 18th, when they started recruiting the disabled, I consider it just cannon fodder. They just threw us away. They said we'd be in the rear, second, third defense, just sitting in the rear. But that's how it was for almost everyone. Many that I know were told they'd be in the rear, but they were sent to the front, just like that, cannon fodder, to be shot. I think there's nothing wrong with surrendering, simply put, and then we'll get exchanged. Maybe something else will happen. But there's nothing scary about it. Not like they keep telling us. None of that's... 
True, 